Can you all hear me well is the first question. I guess the first question should be, did you have a good New Year? Hopefully you all did. It was, uh, yes, I am doing awesome, Audrey. Thank you. So glad you are as well. So, And I did have a good New Year. It was uneventful. Didn't do much. Just kind of hung out and uh, <laughs> watched the ball drop on TV. <laughs> I don't know if that makes me old or not, but... I remember, I remember thinking that as kids, my parents just sitting around doing nothing. And, you know, it wasn't every New Year's Eve. We do stuff sometimes, but there were years where it was just we're just going to hang out at home. And and uh, <laughs> as weird as it sounds, actually, I was talking to my grandma at Christmas time. We were talking about we used to go out and bang pots and pans, and because uh, <laughs> we didn't, I grew up in Oregon and we couldn't do fireworks, and we lived out in the country anyway. So it's like you had to have something to do and go make some kind of noise. There were no fireworks to be had, so we got a bunch of pots and pans and went out and stood on the porch. I remember, I remember doing it one time. We did it apparently a few, a few times, but um, I don't know. It just seems kind of odd to me now looking back, but that's what we did. You know, I, was, I think I was dying or something like that. So, anyway, well, good morning and welcome out to the market mashup. And uh, let's get things rolling here and get right to it. It might be new out for the first time. Maybe you haven't seen this, but the rest of us are used to it. It's uh, we're raised, we're not registered broker dealers, investment advisors. I'm not going to give you any recommendations or advice. Everything that we do is purely educational. Uh, if I am, excuse me, if I'm talking about trading, uh, if I mention a specific trade, if I forget to say paper trade or unfunded trade or practice trade, then assume that it is. Uh, for regulatory reasons, we do not discuss funded trading here in this environment. Actually, there's really no environment we do, right? <laughs> Gotta love regulation. Um, also, we're not subject to trading restrictions, so I could be in a trade, out of a trade, thinking about a trade, looking at a trade at any time. And for those of you who might be new, there is the agenda for the next hour or so. And as I often get, sometimes people that haven't been here to the market mashup yet say, take, say I'm, it's a blank screen, I don't have anything. That is the agenda. And, and uh, actually, I think, I know I keep saying this over and over again, I think that's what makes this class fun. Uh, it is wide open. There is no agenda. We talk about whatever we want to talk about. And if you don't give me something to talk about, then I will start hunting for squirrels. <laughs> and, uh, I keep thinking about that video. i got to find it. I don't even know where I put it. And I don't see Mike here yet. Um, <laughs> he gave me an awesome shirt at the Super Summit about squirrels and it's just it's funny so I gotta see if I can find the video and then if I can and I can figure out a way to play it through here I'll show it to you so so you can all see what you missed at the Super Summit um, but anyway so what do you guys want to talk about you want to talk about charting you want to talk about mindset you want to talk about the market uh, which is breaking down where'd we go I've got this one it was breaking down well it still is basically but and we've got that level, a 2,000 level right there, and Monday we cracked through it but didn't stay below it. So I think, well, it was last, year, last week, I think, we talked about uh, the overall market and thinking that things are long-term going to be headed down. And uh, even on a short-term, we're bearish. I mean, you look just at this chart here. Let me draw a few lines, I guess. It depends on where you start them, where they end up. I mean, you can go, you can go a couple of different ways. You can draw off the close, you can draw off the highs. <laughs> Either way, we're in a bearish trend in the short term, at least. And even if we go a little further back, even intermediate term, we are as well. I mean, you're talking all the way back to. Well, it's been almost a year. The end of February is where we made, well, we made a higher high, I guess, here in May. So now we're, you know, what's that, six, seven, eight months later? And we have basically had lower highs since then. So on a f five to ten months, six to twelve months basis, we are bearish. We meet the definition of a downtrend. Longer term, you know, the uptrend has been broken, but it's still 
uh, we're still longer term making higher highs and higher lows. So, uh, but the interesting part is we're right on. It looks like we're right on the edge of wanting to break down. I mean, we're sitting right at 2,000 right now. The question becomes, how's it going to close out today? I think today will be. I don't know if I'd say it's a critical point, but it could be. Depends on how things. I mean, we're at what? Eight o'clock. Look at eight o'clock. I'm on the West Coast, so uh, eleven o'clock Eastern time. We've got four or five more hours to go in the market. We're an hour and a half in. We got five hours to go. A lot could happen. This thing could rally back and close at 2020, and leave us a big hammer like we had back here in that December. But interestingly enough, you got Monday, which sold off big time, and actually made a new low. New intraday low. Let me see if I make this even bigger. So the low of Monday was lower than back here on December 14th. But it didn't close lower. The question becomes, is that bullish or bearish? Well, we've got a big, what was it, I think down 32 points that day. But it was also down 50 or 55, I think, at one point was the ultimate low. So we made a new intraday low. We did rally back and close a pretty significant amount above 2,000, but you notice last time on December 14th we had a hammer type of pattern. It actually closed up for the day by, I don't know how many points was that, 212, 222, to about 10 points. So the bears had total control in the first part of the market, but by the end of the day the bulls had total control. So the bears were winning in the morning, but by the end of the day the bulls had won. Now we look at Monday and we compare the two. Okay, the bears. First of all, gapped it down, and then took it on a ride down 55, 60 points, whatever it was. So let's see, 2044 to 2090, 2089, 54 points. So the bears take it, take it way, way down. The bulls come in and rally it, but they really didn't rally it that far. I mean, sure, they came back 20, 22 points, but that's less than half the day's total move. So in comparison to the one we had back here in December, this is not very bullish at all, where this candle back here in December is a bullish candle. It's a bullish reversal. It's a hammer pattern right at a massive, a major, major support level. Monday's candle was very telling, just looking at the simple, and this is just basic candlestick analysis. The okay, was that a sign? And then the next day, yesterday, no surprise, we get a little spinning top. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a bump along here along this 2,000 level for a few days. We've got, what, unemployment's coming out Friday. Or did it come out? Did it come out last Friday? Now, some of you are like, this is scary. <laughs> Honestly, I don't that barely even pay attention to the news anymore. I could have sworn unemployment was coming out this Friday. It came out last Friday, didn't it? So I didn't even know. It didn't, and it didn't affect the market enough for me to even pay attention. Okay, that's right. Last week. Well, that's what I couldn't remember. I remember thinking about it last week, going, okay, Friday is New Year's. So are they going to come out Thursday or not? So it is coming out this Friday then. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know some of you are shaking your head. You're going, what? But I've been saying that for a long time. And honestly, I stopped paying super close attention to the news four or five years ago. I mean, I pay attention to you know the major stuff, which unemployment is a major thing, but at the same time, it hasn't been a big deal as of lately. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. It didn't affect the market because it didn't come out yet. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is that a joke or a slap in the face? Or both? <laughs> I'll take it. I can handle the slap in the face. Uh, <laughs> it's okay if it is because the, the, the truth is when you trade the market and you've been doing it as long as I have, you've been slapped in the face so many times it's not a big deal. <laughs> so it is, uh, it's interesting when you really – when you really start to dig deep – and a really serious reflection when when you do trade and you work so hard at it for so long and you try to figure out okay what is it 
what is it that I'm doing wrong? Why is it that I haven't gotten to where I'm going yet? What am I? And when you really take a serious look and you ask the question why and you constantly question yourself, you start to see things that you didn't know were there. You start to recognize and realize that there's a lot deeper reasons, subconscious reasons, that we do things that we do, do the things the way we do. Because we question our own decision making. And it's not any different in just regular life. I mean, we do things in normal life, in you know, in business, in relationships, in all these areas of our life that are the opposite of what we know we should do or what in our mind we should do. I mean, I know people, and not just me. I mean, I mean there's myself personally. It's funny because I was thinking about this this morning. And uh, just reflecting back on how much I've learned about myself and how I essentially learning a lot of the stuff about just basic human behavior and human patterns and why we do the things we do. And it hasn't come, the, the most significant discoveries, if you will, I don't know if I want to call it a discovery, but realization is maybe a better word, have not come from watching other people or studying books or reading or observing others. It's come from observing myself. And it's not easy. And it's funny, I was just thinking about that. It takes and I'm not I'm not trying to, to brag or pat myself on the back, but it takes a lot of courage to look in the mirror and be super honest with yourself. It's not easy to do. It's very difficult. And um, when you trade long enough and you're super honest with yourself, then you start to realize, and I think I already said this, but I mean, we have some serious hurdles that we have to overcome mentally. We have things that we're raised with, beliefs that we're raised with, and the way that we think that um, hurt us. I mean, we, we literally self-sabotage. And it's interesting when you start to learn some of this stuff and you start to see it, and when you see it in yourself and then you also start to watch others and you see them, you see it from an, an outsider's point of view, you see it from a more objective point of view. When It's easy to see it when other people are doing it, right? When you step back and look and say, why are you doing that? I mean, you take trading. I mean, you can sit there and look at somebody else's trade and objectively say, what are you thinking? Why did you do that? And that's easy to do because there's no emotion involved. There's no ego involved. You're at arm's length, essentially. And the challenge becomes being able to do that with ourselves. Be able to step back and have a third-party point of view and be objective and take our ego and our emotions out of the equation and look back at the mirror and be objective with ourselves the same way we would be with anybody else. That is not easy to do. I think that is one of the, the major keys to really long-term becoming successful in trading is being able to separate yourself and your ego and I don't want to say separate your emotions because we really can't separate our emotions, but we can take our ego out of it and analyze ourselves from an objective perspective as if we are somebody else, if that makes sense. In other words, basically step outside of yourself and look at yourself as if you're somebody else. Hopefully that's, that's clear. Um, I kind of debate whether to <laughs> say this or not, but I'm going to because you know what? It's um, we all know that. I, I mean, I like. Let me. Hopefully, this won't start. Um, 
not only did I, did I rediscover Audible a year or so ago, but in, in human psychology is a huge thing that I love getting into, and I really do. It's it's one of those things that I study myself probably more than anybody. Um, and this is it, it's weird. I just started listening to this book yesterday. And I was listening to it this morning for a while. And it's interesting how you get into something like this that is so that seems so far afield, so far off of the trading arena. Yet I start listening to it and the things that come out of it and the deeper psychological things that we all have, and I realize that what the author is talking about relates to our trading and our success in trading, whether or not we get there or not. And so I thought about it this morning too, and I was like, "Do I?" I mean, it's a, it's kind of an odd book to recommend, but at the same time, I think if you really want to go deep. And you want to look inward and figure out some of the reasons why, and you can take some of the information out of here and relate it to trading, and you go, oh, there's part of it. And honestly, a lot of it has to do with our upbringing and the things that we're taught and the way that we're raised to believe and how we see things. And a lot of it is our own self-talk, and I'm only about halfway through this book, but She's getting into it's Brene Brown. If you've heard of the author, she has become very popular in the last few years. Um, she's what's considered the shame researcher, um, and it, I know it seems odd to think about that in with respect to trading the markets because you think, well, it's not related, but the reality is that it is. And the title of the book is called "Men, Women, and Worthiness," and it's babe, it's. Brene Brown, B, it's B as in Bravo, E-N-E, -E. so Brene, so you know what, maybe, let's see if I can just, uh, let's see, I'm going to see if I can just pull up the title for you, and then you can see it visually. This stuff's in the way. Give me just a second. I'll pull it so you can all see it because I know you're some of you are shaking your heads going, what is this all about? Um, there it is. That's the, uh, that's the title of it right there. You should be able to see that. And really, I mean, quite frankly, it's, it's uh, you know, you look at this right here, the power of being enough, and a lot of stuff that she says in there about, um, you know, basically how we perceive ourselves and how we see things and how we see and the self-talk and the conversation we have with each other. And why did I do that? That was stupid. That was dumb. I can't believe I did that. And we do that to ourselves in trading. You do something that maybe you shouldn't have. You look back and you go, like, oh, what, what was I thinking? And you beat yourself up. So you shame yourself, which creates this, this self-perpetuating fear, this downward spiral of I'm never going to make it. You start to tell yourself, I'm never going to make it. Why am I doing this? I'm not going to. I can't do this. And most people literally, and it's funny to see and thinking of the conversations I've had with students over the years, and a few situations that I've I remember, and so many people shame themselves into quitting. I mean, for God's sake, we're human. We make mistakes. We do things that are dumb. We we mess up things in our life. We do it in business. We do it in relationships. We do it in you know with our kids. We do all kinds of. We make all kinds of. We make mistakes every single day. But for some reason, we have this idea in our mind that you know when we do something, we should be perfect at it. And that's one thing she talks about big time is perfectionism. 
and the source of perfectionism, and those of you that know me know that I am a perfectionist. And this was one thing that really hit home for me was that being a perfectionist, perfectionism comes from shame. And the big difference is, and I don't want to go too deep into this, I mean, you can all listen to the book, but um, it, it, quite frankly, it's it's as a parent, especially of two little kids, and um, I look at it and go, and I, I look at my upbringing, and I was, a, I was a spoiled kid. I mean, my parents did a lot of really good things for us. We We had a lot of, not things, but we got a lot of, we traveled a lot, not a ton. I mean, we didn't go over the world, but we did We did a lot of fun stuff. I'm not a spoiled brat, but I was definitely spoiled compared to what most kids had. And I had a good life, and I have great parents. They're good people. But like all of us do as parents, they made mistakes, and they did things. And I look at this, and especially listening to this and, and some of her other work, is that I was raised with a lot of shame. And there's shame and there's guilt. Um, yeah, hang on just a second, Leticia. And the difference, there, it's on the screen now. The difference between shame and guilt is significant. And when you think of the two, a lot of times people will think of them the same, but um, shame essentially, and it's funny because I was just listening to this this morning, and she went through it again. She talks about it in the very beginning of the book, and then she went through it again and got a little more detailed, but shame essentially is that you're not... Shame has to deal with who you are as a person to the core. Guilt is your behavior was bad. Shame says, I am stupid. What did I do that for? That was dumb. I can't believe I'm this stupid. I made a dumb mistake. You know, it, it was just dumb. I'm stupid. I am stupid versus I did something stupid. That's probably the easiest way to put it. I think that's what she used was I did something stupid versus I am stupid. I made a mistake versus I am a mistake. One is an internalization, it is an identification, one is a behavior. One says, I acted in a foolish or stupid way, the other one says, I am foolish or stupid. Shame says, I am this way, guilt says, I made a mistake, I behaved in a bad way. And so, if you understand the difference between those two, and you start to separate out who you are as a person versus your behavior, it becomes a lot easier to, I don't know if I want to say tolerate, but you stop beating yourself up. And I remember I, I, the countless times in trading where I went, what the hell was I thinking? That was stupid. I'm just I'm so f stupid for doing that. And somewhere along the line, and that's why this is this is, is so hits home with me so much is because somewhere along the line I learned to separate the two. I didn't see it in the, the shame and guilt categories, but I learned to separate out that behavior versus who you are are two different things. And it's one thing that I try desperately, and I know I'm, well, maybe I'm not off topic, I don't know, I think it all kind of relates. I'm working extraordinarily hard to make sure that my children know the difference. When they misbehave and they do something, they get in trouble and they have consequences, I make sure they understand that it's their behavior that I'm not happy with. They're still a good person. It doesn't change who they are as people, but their behavior is unacceptable. And it's really, and I, know, I know it maybe feels like I'm way off in left field, but the reality is that those deep subconscious things that we get, that we're raised with, a lot of us are raised with shame. We bring that mindset of, I'm not good enough, I'll never succeed, I won't, all this negative self-talk, we bring it into trading. Excuse me. And <laughs> I was wondering when somebody was going to say that. <laughs> it is, uh, 
And thank you, though, for verbalizing this. So, Audrey says, awesome insight, totally fitting. And it really is. And this, honestly, this is why I, I know it seems kind of odd to mention, and that's why I said it, that kind of a book. But at the same time, when that kind of material and that kind of insight relates to our trading and why we are or are not successful, it becomes extremely significant. And actually, I've, the, the crazy thing is, is I've had that audiobook for probably two or three months because I have the, you know, it's fourteen ninety five a month at Audible. I should charge them for a fee for promoting them, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it's 15 bucks a month. I get a credit, so I go pick a book. Well, if I haven't got through my other books, then I'll, you know, sit on it or if, sometimes I'll find one that I think is more interesting. And uh, I'll go to that one, but I haven't. I haven't listened to this, and just, for some reason last night I just decided to, and it really started to hit home. And uh, and I always I'm, I'm not only thinking about it from a, a personal perspective, but trading as well, because it it's it really is all one and the same. I mean, the things we experience in trading are no different than the things we experience in real life. From business to relationships to work to anything really, and it's why I have said multiple times over the years that trading is one of the most difficult businesses to succeed at in the world. And I fully believe that if you can succeed in the market, you can succeed at just about anything in life because the amount of courage and introspection and self-reflection, the amount of work you have to do to figure out why you behave in the way you do, when you translate those things into other areas of your life, it improves those areas as well. You take the lessons that you've learned from trading and apply them in other areas And it can be pretty amazing what happens. Let me grab it. Denise, I'm coming back to your comment you made a little bit ago. Nice. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people are doing that, are they not? <laughs> he says, picking up a moving to Texas from California. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, I have, uh, you know, if it wasn't for my kids being in Washington State, or if I didn't have kids, I would, uh, I would probably move to Texas myself. I don't like the summers there. Well, there's certain areas that are nice, but like Dallas and Houston, oh, the, the summers there are just horrific. It's like Florida. I can't stand the humidity. Because I, I, I sweat so easily that I go out, you know, it's 90 degrees and 4 million percent humidity, I just start to drip. And I get uncomfortable and I get cranky and and then I stink and I just, it's just not comfortable for me. Um, <laughs> so, hey, I told you to be brutally honest, right? But, uh, good, Denise. Well, congratulations, I think. I'm assuming that's in order. Um but yeah, if it's going to change your financial, if you're going to be debt free, that's awesome. You know, that can be a, a big burden off your back, and it's really, you know, it really is a, a whole mindset thing, and it's not necessarily not to. I don't know. It, it's if I may, I'm going to not necessarily pick it apart, but just look at, because you said here, Denise, and hopefully gain a new perspective and mindset. Do you hope to, or are you going to actively work at it? And I, I know I'm being nitpicky, and I don't necessarily like to do that. I used to be way worse than I am now, but at the same time, there's sometimes these little subtle differences that, and a lot of times it's real small. And I use this example just a week or two ago with my kids where I say, you know, there's a little, uh, sometimes there's very slight differences. 
and that little tiny difference could make all the difference. And I remember years ago, I think it was Brian Tracy, it was a, a book or audio book I was listening to. He said they went back and did a study of the Kentucky Derby and the difference from the first place, the winner, to the second place. They looked at it in how much faster the winner was versus the second place finisher. And the difference over the years, they, they, you know, they took all the different times, they had all the data there, and they went and calculated it out, and the difference from first place to second place was only 10%. The winner of the Kentucky Derby, the horse that won, was 10% faster than the second place finisher. Yet the prize money for first place versus second is 10 times as much. I think it was... I don't pay attention to that. I'm not into Kentucky Derby or horses. But I think the prize money was a million dollars for first place and only a hundred thousand for second, regardless of the numbers work. But that little tiny difference, that ten percent, only ten percent difference between first and second place brings in ten times the result. And sometimes those subtle little differences make all the difference. So, um, and really it's not a whole lot different in trading. I keep coming back to that because it's, it's true. It's, it's the little things that can make all the difference. So... Well, teacher, I'm looking back at your comment here. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> she said, <laughs> I love to hear this stuff, too, and this is why this is so much fun for me. Because I'm honestly, as much as you guys might learn from me, I learn more from you guys, I think, than, I don't know. It's a two-way street, and that's the beauty of this. This is why I love teaching. Well, teacher says, it's very fitting, because I said something about being in the left field. Not at all in left field. I went two weeks without saying positive affirmations. It was shocked at how negative I was toward my trading mistakes. Of course, I didn't realize my negativity until I started saying my affirmations again. And I appreciate the honesty and, and saying, you know, basically she said, I got off track. I had a habit. I had a way of doing things. And then I got off track and I became who I used to be. In other words, you use, you use affirmations to change your mindset and get to a place where you're thinking positive. And when you stop doing that, you go back to the old place you used to be. That's <laughs> kind of funny here. Um, where's that? Oh, where'd it go? There's another book if you want one. I know, and I've got the reading list together. I can't remember who was asking for that. I think it was Keith, he's not even here. Um, I need to add a few more to it. Actually, I need to add some of these. I did it on the fly, and I keep meaning to. I don't remember if I. I don't remember if I sent that out or not. If I uploaded it to the insights or not. I thought I did, but then the other day I was questioning myself, going, I don't know if I did or not. But this is another one that is intriguing. Um, I started this one, and I, I'm. I think I'm about a third of the way, because you can see here it tells you the length: 10 hours and 57 minutes. It's 11 hours. That takes a while to get through. But I've gotten through, I think, two or three or four hours of this, and it goes right to what. Leticia was saying about you know getting developing habits, and it's hard when you get in a habit and you get into a routine of doing things to change that habit. It's like some of you know that are in my insights, you know, adding. Um, I mean, Keith is putting a couple of requests. I know uh, Andrew actually asked for some stuff, and I'm it's on the schedule today to get that done. And obviously, we've had some technology issues in the last few weeks, but it is what it is. But once you develop a habit. It's there, and we all have habits. And the question is, how do you change the habit? You don't ever, you can't ever destroy a habit. And it's that, that's what triggered the thought with Letitia's comment is that I had a habit of doing affirmations. I got away from that habit, and then I realized how it was affecting me, and I went back to the habit. The habit's there, but what happened is when you got rid of the intentional habit of positive affirmations then what came back? 
that negativity. The old habit, the way that, I mean, let's just call it what it is, the way we're raised. We, we develop these habits as kids from our parents of doing things a certain way and thinking a certain way and believing certain things. And even if we make a conscious effort to change those habits, if we don't stay on top of it constantly, then those old habits come back. And it's one of the reasons that I trade the way I do. It's one of the reasons I do things the way I do is because I realized probably four or five, six years ago the value of routine and having a habit and sticking with one thing, being disciplined enough to stick with what you're good at. And especially from where I sit, getting questions from students all the time, well, what about this strategy? Should I do this one? Should I do that one? And I go sometimes to look at it. I go, I like that. That looks good. I mean, 40% rate of return for a spread. You got you know, a dollar spread. You're getting 35, 40 cents on it. And it's tempting for me to go there. And I've done it in the past, but it's been a few years since I did that because I realized every time I do that, I get off track and then my other stuff suffers. And so there's a lot of value in routine and habit and sticking with your niche. I just read something, a friend of mine who lives down in Palm Springs sent me an article um, about a business, I'm trying to remember what it was, it was a few months ago, about how this lady got into this business, she was extraordinarily successful, and the interviewer, I think it was a magazine article, the interviewer asked her, so well, all these other people have come into your space. They're doing the same thing you're doing, but they're adding all these other services. And they're making extra profits off of these other things because the customers demand it, or the customers want it. And her answer was, yes, it's very tempting to get off into those areas. It's very tempting to do that because we could make some extra money off that. But that would take away from what we're best at. And this is what we do best, and we're going to stay in this space because we're the best at it. And it takes a tremendous amount of discipline to do that, to say, here's what I've mastered, here's what I'm good at, I'm going to stick with that. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if that's something that you haven't realized yet, then there is a lot of value in having a routine and doing things consistently over and over in the same way. And I honestly, I haven't mastered it. <laughs> There's a lot of things I haven't mastered. I've improved on some things. There are a few things I've mastered, but there are still things that I struggle with. I mean, it's just it's human nature, and it's a constant battle. And that's where, you know, looking at the market and just you know stepping back from the big picture, you go, there are so many things, and this is where so many people stumble in the beginning. It's why so many people get off track, and it's why I try to make the point early, especially when somebody's new to the market, is. There's a million different things to look at. And if you're interested in overwhelming yourself and confusing yourself, then go try to figure it all out. Because you can turn on CNBC and you can listen to all that stuff and all the commentators who are nothing more than journalists. They don't know much. They're reading off the screen most of the time. Some of them have some knowledge. Some of them have a basic you know, foundational knowledge. Some of them are very knowledgeable. But for the most part, they're journalists. So you can turn on CNBC, you can listen to 14 different people, you can read 50 million books about vast different subjects. There's something like 2,500 books written on investing or trading. 2,500, really? There's really not that many ways to trade, but everybody has their opinion. Everybody has their specific way you're supposed to do it. Theirs is right and everybody else is wrong, which is ridiculous, but whatever. I mean, you've got trading, you've got technical analysis, you've got psychology, you've got options trading, then you've got futures and forex. You've got, you've got so many different ways you can go. And with that story fresh in my mind, with the lady that had the oh, it was a blowout bar. That's what it was. She had a, um, I, think, I think that's the name of it, the blowout bar. I don't, remember, I think, it, I don't know if it's in New York or it's, I don't remember where she started it. But, well, okay, gentlemen, 
blow out bar. I didn't know this either. Blow out bars where women go in and get their hair blown out. So there's something to do with getting a blow dry professionally done and doing whatever else they do. I have no clue. Okay, I've never had long hair. Never planned to. I have no idea what a blowout is. I saw some pictures, um, but it's something to do with hair. Let's put it that way. But it's inexpensive and it's quick. And sorry, ladies, but you like to feel good about how you look, and that's the way it is. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's it, it's thing that it's a thing that's become very popular with women because it's cheap and it's fast, and you get that feeling that you just left the salon. without the big ticket because <laughs> spending, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, ladies, but dropping a couple hundred bucks at the salon is no big deal, you know, to get your hair done. You're there for an hour or two and you spend 200 $300 and it's like, but, but, to me, I'm always like, how do you do that? And my haircut's 15 20 bucks. I just got it done yesterday. It was 18 bucks. Okay. But... Anyway, it is what it is. Maybe I should get off that topic. <laughs> so do guys. What do you mean? Oh, like to feel good? Well, yeah, we all do. Oh, I got you. <laughs> That's awesome, Denise. It could have been a man. Uh Where was I? <laughs> I don't remember. That was so funny. It totally threw me off track. Oh, the discipline thing. That's where I was trying to get to. I found a few squirrels today. Um, I think of, you know, anytime I read a story like that with, you know, somebody that's in any kind of business, really, that has been successful, I try to look at it, what are the core, what are the core reasons that they've been successful? And the core reason that she has been successful is she's focused on one thing and one thing only. And we do, this is what we do best, this is our niche, and we're going to stick to it. And as much as I'd like to go off and do some of these other things, because yeah, we probably could make some extra money off of it, I'm going to be disciplined and stick to what we're best at. We're going to stay here in this place, because if we go over here, we dilute what we do over here, we take the thing that we do best, and instead of doing it best, now we become mediocre at it. I don't think trading is any different. So if you haven't figured out yet what your niche is in the market, what you're best at, that work for you that keeps your – where you can keep your emotions in check, where you can manage your trading in a, in a cool, calm, confident way, where you're not freaking out, you're not nervous, and – if you sleep an hour past the market open, it's not a big deal because you're not worried about your trades. That's the place I'm at. Even though I prefer to get up early, some days, for whatever reason, I can't sleep or I'm up late or I get other stuff's going on or I have my kids every other Thursday night, so a lot of times we'll stay up late if they don't have school or I just don't feel like getting out of bed, whatever the case is. <laughs> But the beauty is I don't worry about my trades anymore like I used to. And once you get to that place, it's it's not only freeing, but it's just it's relaxing. And you just and it's just trading. It just becomes a a routine, like getting up and brushing your teeth and having coffee and eating. It becomes enjoyable, like eating, especially if it's frozen milk with sugar in it, ice cream. <laughs> trading becomes fun at that point. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Bruce. And that is a long time. Bruce says, I haven't paid for a haircut since 1978. <laughs> you know what? You're getting off cheap, Bruce. <laughs> if, that's, if, that, if that's the benefit of keeping her happy. I mean, I got, well, wait, maybe I have this turned around. Am I understanding that right? No, 
No, I think I have that flip backwards. I think I have that. <laughs> I think I have it backwards. <laughs> Maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, yeah, you're going to like that, Denise. It's huh? 830 in Texas. So let's get back and take a look quickly at the market and see. Um, and here's one thing, too, about, you know, we were talking about this before I found that whole colony of squirrels. Um, looking back at December 14th and looking at Monday and seeing the intraday low that we have for Monday, and then the fact that it didn't, I mean, the bulls took back some of the gain or some of the drop, but not much, realistically, not even half. And we look at today, we've made a new intraday low. So we went lower than we went on Monday, lower than we went on the 14th back in December. And so what really will, the close will determine a lot here. And so, um, yeah, it's it's really going to be interesting to see what happens by the end of the day, because it really is we're, we're kind of at a breaking point where we're either going to recognize this point again and bounce, and then from there, who knows. But if we crack it, if we close below 2,000, so if we sell off at the end of the day, then we drop down and close 1990, 1995, anywhere there or lower. In other words, we have a significant break. If it closes right where it's at now, if this was the end of the day, I wouldn't be that bearish. But if it drops off and we have a big candle and it breaks 2,000 significantly, and especially if it does it with an increase in volume, especially a substantial increase in volume, then I would get very bearish. If it stays where it's at or goes higher from here, I would be neutral, maybe slightly bullish. So it's really going to depend on how this thing closes because we're right there on the, we're on the edge of that. So. Oh, uh, yeah, Bruce. <laughs> she gives you free haircuts. I'll practice on your... Four, you have four sons? I think I knew that. I just had forgotten. I'm glad you clarified that. I, I didn't think you were bald. So it's been a while since we've seen each other, but I was like, no, I'm pretty sure he's got all his hair, but I'm glad you clarified. <laughs> yeah, my brother and I, when we were in uh, school, in, a, in high school, and then a year or two after, before he left for the Marines, he uh, he and I cut each other's hair. So it uh, it's easy. So, I mean, men's hair is not terribly difficult. I don't, at least not mine. Mine's a piece of cake. The lady yesterday did it in like 10 minutes. Done. So, um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the market today. And go see, see what the big high flyers are doing real quick. <coughs> Any questions, any requests, any, because we are about, they got about 10 minutes, so, um, awesome, thank you, Darlo. Oh, perfect question. What do you do in your trading that you are not worried with the big swings in the morning? What I'm not worried about, and let me get to one of these. I think which one might be better. This one, Northrop might be better. Well, there's a couple things. Um, number one is I figured out a few years back that probability is everything. Having the odds on your side is everything. And when you realize how important it is and you realize and you really not necessarily realize but accept because there's a big difference between realizing something and knowing something in your mind and fully accepting that that's the way it is and I, I don't know why my mind just went here but it did um, well I know because it's I was looking at it yesterday and you know, texting uh, one of my best friends down in Oregon 
we went to Daytona four years ago, I think now, with a gentleman that used to be another one of my best friends, two guys I grew up with. Um, but Pat passed away back in, I think it was 2011, maybe it was 12. Um, yeah, it was, it was 2012, I believe. So four years ago, uh, April 21st. And he had uh, my best friend Brett now already had called me in December and said, "Hey, Pat really wants to go to Daytona 500. It's one of his bucket list things. Do you have any air miles left?" And so I used my since I used to travel all the time, I had tons of air miles and hotel points. So I hooked us up with a trip to Daytona. There were five of us that went, <laughs> and so that was February of 12. And two months later, he passed away. He had cancer. He had melanoma. He was 33 or 34. I think he had just turned 34. Um, and we had made a decision as the, the four of us, I mean, there were five of us that went, but Josh and jo John, his brother, and Josh and Brett and me, the four of us, decided to get together each year for Daytona. And that's why I was looking it up yesterday to see if we're getting together in, in, in Oregon in our hometown to do Daytona in kind of a, as as um, just in remembrance of Patton and to honor him and so the first year after so 2013 a couple of years ago three years ago however long it was I was down there at and we were at Brett's house getting ready to go over to uh, I think we we're I can't remember where we were going to watch the race but um, and it hit him right then it took almost a full year it was a full ten months for it to really sink in with him, the Pat was gone. I mean, he had passed 10 months before that, but all of a sudden, here we are getting ready to go over and watch the race, and he just lost it because one of his best friends is gone, and I mean, it was it was rough on both of us, but it's like it, it, it took him a full 10 months to really accept it, the reality that he wasn't with us anymore. And so, I don't know, like I said, I don't know, I'm not trying to use a sad story or anything, but that's the reality. Sometimes... Things happen, and we see it, and we know it, and we recognize it, but we don't fully accept it. And I learned a long time ago probability and odds and how important it was, but I didn't fully accept it, and I didn't accept the power that was in it. But once you realize that trading it is about really when you get down to the core of it two things number one it's about odds number two which the odds lead to is managing your emotions those are the two core things that you must do in trading and when you have the odds on your side <coughs> when you set up a trading plan like I mean and this is the way I do things is there's an ascending triangle here on north of Grumman I don't have it drawn. I have it drawn on extreme charts, but that, is, that doesn't matter. To get to, to answer your question, the point is that when you have a trading plan in place and you know the odds are on your side, then all of a sudden, a lot of these little movements that freak you out don't really matter. Because Northrop, for example, I think it was what day was it? It was last week. It was New Year's week when I got into this thing. I think it was one of those two days where it touched the orange line a week ago. Pretty sure it was one of those two days. And I know I'm going to be made a hypocrite here, so watch this. So I got in one of those two days. The next day, or this day here, the day after that candle, let me blow this up even bigger. It gaps down and just kind of dances on a stop. And I didn't take a real big position in the first place. And there's part of it right there. When you learn to manage your emotions, you recognize, okay, here's a situation. I'm not that bullish on the overall market. I'm very neutral and actually lean to the bearish side. So when I see something that's moderately maybe bullish, but I'm kind of, you know, kind of nervous, I scale back and do a small position. You know, if you normally do 10, then on this, maybe it's two or three contracts. So in other words, I gauge not only my view of the overall market, my analysis of the market, but the risk analysis is that if the market drops off, which is what I'm expecting, 
then it's probably going to drag this with it. So I don't want to have a ton of risk out there. And the beauty of that, and this goes right to your, your question is, that when a day like this happens, even though I have a plan in place that says 189.35 is my exit, and intraday it's moving around, but by the end of the close, it's 50 or 60 cents below my stop out point. I'm going, okay, I don't have a lot of risk here. I've only got, I don't even know how many contracts, two or three, I think. I've only got two or three contracts on this thing, so I have less risk than normal. I'm comfortable giving it a little bit more time. It's down 50 cents from the, the stop. I'll give it another day. I know that's technically breaking the rules, but at the same time, rules are there, and I follow them. At the same time, there's some discretion, and sometimes you bend them or adjust them. And considering it's a small position anyway, I'm going, okay, if it gaps down four or five bucks, it's going to cost me an extra two or $300. Not that big of a deal. Not worried about it. So one of the reasons, one of the ways that I'm not worried about it is I make sure position size that makes sense for the my analysis of what I believe is going to happen in the market, especially if it's going the opposite of what I think may happen. But the reality is the market could go up too. It's a 50-50 shot. So if it does, then I'm in great position. If it doesn't, then I have less risk. And then you see what happened the next day. Right here, boom, it gaps down. I mean, it got down pretty big. It was what, 180, almost 189 to 180, 186, so three bucks, about two and a half, three bucks. I'm like, huh. Obviously not terribly excited, but at the same time, I'm going, it really didn't cost me a ton because I don't have a big position. I thought, okay, we'll watch it for a little bit. And then you see the bands. go, okay, it could bounce off the bands. And, it, and right now, it's there's a justification in the mind. Go, okay, I'm going to give it a little extra time. And the main reason is because I can answer one very simple question. I was comfortable with the risk. You should always ask the question before you get into trade, am I comfortable with the amount of risk that I'm taking in this trade? If it goes, if it gets worse than, and it's significantly worse than expected, if it gaps two and a half to three dollars to the downside or against my trade, whichever way you're going, Am I okay with giving that much money to the market, however much it might cost me? That's probably the core answer to your question is, if you're comfortable with the amount of risk you have, then you don't worry about your trades. And if you have figured out all the different possibilities and say this thing could gap down 8, 10 points, and obviously that wouldn't be fun, the odds, aren't, the odds are not there that it's going to. Two or $3 gap, yeah, it can do that. It does it. It did it. But if I know what my risk is and I'm comfortable with that amount of risk, worst case scenario, or maybe not worst case, but a bad case, then I don't worry about it. I have a plan in place, and yeah, will I adjust and modify that plan? Yes. And then notice what happened yesterday. Thing ran up for almost five bucks. I was like, woo! I'm glad I held on. And even though I don't promote holding on, I say use your stops, put a stop in place. And that is good advice. And you know what? I could have gotten out there, and I could have gotten back in yesterday. Or I could have just gotten out and said, I'll take my lumps and go, and it's no big deal. And either way, I wouldn't care. If I would have just taken a loss, it wouldn't have mattered. But because of my reduced amount of risk from the get-go, based on my analysis, I was comfortable hanging on a little bit longer. Even though I was breaking my own rules, I followed my rule from the beginning – which was always make sure you're comfortable with the risk and then adjusting the plan or hanging on a little bit longer is easier. So hopefully that made some sense and it was a, a, an answer to your question. But really, creating the trading plan, the number one puts the odds on your side. And then making sure that you're not taking too much risk. And really, that, that's usually where this question comes from with most people. If you're worried about your trades and you're concerned about what you might lose if things gap or things go fast or they move against you, then you're trading with too big of positions. You have too much risk on the table.
because when you can not worry about your trades, when you can go to sleep at night and if you sleep through your alarm or if you don't get up, if you don't want to get up before the market opens, then you don't worry about it because you're comfortable. So hopefully that made sense. But I mean that's that's really the long and short of it. So it's really not. I, I know to some people you go that's too simple. That's too simple of an answer. Okay. Trading is really not that complicated. I mean it's not easy, but it is simple. The concepts are simple. Is okay. Here's the analysis. Here's the pattern. Here's what it means. Here's the odds. Here's the trading plan. I mean it's. Don't overthink it. Overcomplicate it. And honestly, it's a mistake that we all make. I did it. I used to look at 15 different indicators, and then I realized that there's only five. I don't need to look at all that stuff. I used to watch all the news and go crazy over everything. I used to sit and stare at the screen, and I used to take way too much risk. I used to put too big of positions on. I used to have no stops. I used to never have a plan. And it was nerve-wracking. And it's constantly anxious, and it's like this sucks. I don't like. I don't even like this. It's not even fun because you're always on edge. But when you get to a place that you recognize that odds are one of the most critical, important things you can do, because the reality is it's 50-50. And here's the beauty, Darlo. Even though I showed you an example of something that gapped against me, when you wake up in the morning late, you choose not to get up, whatever reason it is. And you wake up on a stock gapped in your favor by four or five points, whoo, that's a good day. <laughs> and so it really is, it's 50-50. And there's another thing, when you really truly accept that it's a 50-50 shot whether a stock goes up or down, and you realize how important odds are, and then you start to implement a trading plan that puts the odds on your side, and then you start to ask the question, okay, what's my analysis? Where do I think this thing's going? What am I what am I looking at from the overall market? And where am I comfortable? How much risk am I comfortable with? And you answer all those questions and you implement that mindset and that process. That's where the absence of worry comes from. Just trying to kind of wrap it into a nice little package into one shot, but that hopefully that makes sense. So and I am officially supposed to be done two minutes ago. So let's see where we go. So I'm going to wrap up real quick. Any other very quick question to shoot them off, and I will try to answer them quickly. But you all know you're all familiar. I think most of you are at least. Um, Market Insights is a quarterly deal uh, for three months. So it's 9.95 normally. It's 7.95 here if you get it at the web shop. And essentially, it's uh, you know I'm showing you candidates, my overall position, my my view of the overall market. Um, barring any glitches, <laughs> I know there's a couple of you here that have experienced that in the last few weeks. And uh, like I said in the one I just uploaded yesterday, I think it was, is it's frustrating. It's you know extreme charts has given us issues, and I thought after the issues last month, we were going to be off to a new year with you know a good start. And there's still little glitches, so but it is what it is. And like I said, my insights last night, it's you know there's one thing you learn from trading is to just relax and, and learn that things are what they are. The market's going to do what it's going to do regardless of what you think or what you feel or what you want. You have zero control over it. The only thing you control is the, the thing that's between your ears and <clears throat> how you react and how do you adapt to the things that do happen. And so if you're waking up, you know, if you're worried about your trades with the big swings, even, in, I mean, it doesn't really matter what the market conditions are. I know the last few days, Things, things have been normal. I mean, the market's always, that's the thing, is what is normal? And the market hasn't been sideways, so it's been a little more challenging when it just kind of stagnant, it's not moving, especially with the Christmas and stuff. When it's stagnant and not moving much, and it's just kind of, it does make it a little more difficult to trade. When it's moving in one direction, then, you know, when there's a solid trend in place, then it kind of is easier, but it's still really not. So um, there are some periods that are a little more challenging than others. But for the most part, trading is trading. Um, 
and I don't remember where I was even going with that. I don't know. I thought I had a point, but maybe I didn't. So, <laughs> welcome to my world. Say to people, I want to get in your heads. Like, no, you don't. It's scary in there. Stay away. But uh, insights. Um, <laughs> well, basically, if you want to get in my brain, the insights are where to go. And uh, <laughs> but I, I'll show the patterns. I'll show the market update. What to that? That's where I was going with it. Um, <laughs> Alco is coming out with earnings on Monday. They usually kick off earnings season, so um, yeah, it's just a it, it's a great way to learn and understand and go from the nervous anxious because I cover all that stuff. I show the trading plan, so here are some candidates, here are some options, and then when you send me a request, say, would you do this? I tried to. I think I did that yesterday. One uh, Keith had asked me to talk more about the emotions behind certain patterns, and we had um, an on the neck pattern with app. I think it was Apple, if I remember right. And so I went through that just briefly and explained that. I'm trying to I'm trying to get into the habit of implementing some of these things. And it is when you're in that routine, it's it's hard to do it sometimes. But uh, so I would ask for patience. Something I also learned from the market and kids. But then I also have patterns of flash and advanced trading mindset. Patterns of flash is all technical analysis and <laughs> advanced trading mindset. This cough's almost gone. Is all about mindset. It's all about psychology of trading. And so I don't know if you've experienced that yet or not, Darlow, but this might be a good one for you. If you haven't done Advanced Trading Mindset, I would say get it because there's six and a half hours of audio and video in here that is purely about mindset. I think there's one chart that I show in there, and that's it. Everything else is purely about having the right – developing the right mindset so you don't worry about your trade. So you do get to a calm, cool, collected place. That's really what the entire thing is about, and that came about. Actually, it was, it was kind of accidental. I started putting together some bonus sessions in my insights a few years ago, and one of those supervisors at the company who had to go, they have to go through and, and make sure we're not saying things we're not supposed to. So she's monitoring this. She sends me an email one day. She goes, hey, you need to create a whole other tool with this material because it's out of this world. I'm going, I, I just thought it was, I mean, it was just extra stuff I was throwing out there to, to insight subscribers. Though. She goes, no, it's that good. It's and so I, okay. So I went to work and I I added a bunch to it. I think I put an hour or two. It's all up there. But um, it turned out after going through it more and and really kind of digging deep to about six and a half hours. Um, so and you can see the prices two twenty nine a quarter. The beauty is that that's just the first time you get it. If you decide to renew it at the end of the quarter and keep it active, it's just ninety nine bucks to keep it active. So it's just a two twenty nine the first quarter. And then you can keep it active as long as you want for just 99 bucks. So, if you get the platinum package, that's all three: uh, market insights, patterns of the flash, and advanced trading mindset, all for just 995. So, uh, you get, obviously you get a package deal, you get a better deal that way. So, so that is it. Any other quick questions? Very quickly. <laughs> yes, I think I know exactly what you were laughing at, Denise. So, <laughs> and don't laugh until you know it's true. Because once you get in my head, it is scary. But no, I appreciate you all hanging out. Um, what's the renewal? Oh, on the on the platinum, it's 9.95. I know it, maybe it should be there, but um, yeah, the platinum package is 9.95 uh, per quarter. So if you do that, because uh, it's if you do the insights, it's 7.95. And then if you did patterns and flash and advanced trading mindset, you'd be if you did them. Individually at the workshop price, 795, so 800 and 229, so 400 and 1200, be about 1260 bucks if you did it independently, and then renew on the insights is 795, and then 99 for each of those, so, you, so you'd beat 995 anyway. So if you renewed, so the platinum package is 995, so um, which is the best way to get it as far as pricing goes. So, but I'm assuming that's what you were talking about, Darlo. If you're talking about the other two tools, they're, the renewal price on Patterns of Flash and Advanced Trading Mindset is 99 each. So um, you're welcome. So if you can do, in fact, I'll do that. I usually run out of time, and I am out of time technically. But um, <clears throat> this came to me well. It's been a, it's been a little over a year actually. I can't believe it's been that long. Just Mike sent this in, but basically he said he he got the plan the package, and he was explaining in here, you know, just paraphrasing what he said is, um, you know, I've got the insights, explaining things he had asked for a specific uh, thing I talk about stops. In fact, 
Andrew, that's one thing you asked. Uh, I probably could go pull the video I did there and, and use it again, but because uh, I did the same thing as I just I threw a bonus video together based on a request of uh, moving the stops and why, and I'm about to do the same thing here in about two or three hours. Um, but he basically went through it and said, you know, I'm doing this, and once I move my stop, he says here, once I move in the second, third paragraph, but once I started moving some stops, I found the emotion going away. So basically, he's taking what he learned from not only my market insights, but advanced trading mindset and patterns of flash, and combining all three of them. It really is kind of a, a trifecta when you get all three. You get the mindset, you get the technical analysis, and then you get two or three days a week, stuff that's happening right then and there. And when you put all that together and you bring it in, throw it into one pot, mix it up, it's a phenomenal way to speed up the learning process. And really that's what I'm all about because I'm all about efficiency. I don't like taking longer to do things than necessary. That was the whole concept, the whole purpose of Patterns in a Flash is when I started back in 2000, it was books and live workshops. And you read books and there's no way to train your eyes to see the patterns. There was nothing in place, no mechanism to do that. And one day on a plane, I thought, well, why wouldn't this work? You know, my mom was a teacher for 28 years. We use flashcards. Why not use flashcards for chart patterns? And so I developed them for myself. It worked. And so a few years later, when technology was there, I started working on patterns on a flash. And it came out of my own frustration. But the whole purpose of that was to speed up the process, to get from point A to point B quicker. And that's really everything that I do because I am an efficiency freak. I mean, why am I going to spend two years learning something if I can do it in six months? If I can speed up the process, why wouldn't I? Because I have other things I want to do. I want to get to my destination quicker so that I can do other things or bigger, better things or whatever the case is. So that really is I mean, the entire purpose of why I teach is to get you from point A to point B faster. So, so there we have it. i got to wrap up and uh, call it a day. So we will see you all... Uh, either next week or if you join me in the insights, any one of these tools, uh, shoot me an email. You'll get my email address as well. You'll have my bonus material, which will be loaded onto your uh, my accounts page. And just so it's clear, the patterns of flash and advanced trading mindset are not live classes. They're all pre-recorded. They're there on demand. They'll work on your mobile devices. So if you're sitting in jury duty like a guy three or four years ago, he goes, you saved me from jury duty. You know, what do you mean? And he goes, I was on jury duty. I was bored out of my mind. I got out my phone. I started watching the patterns of flash videos. All day long, he sat there in jury duty waiting to be called or whatever he was doing, and he was studying and learning the whole time, past the time. He said it passed the time so much faster. But, uh, yeah, I thought I had a point, but anyway. All right, <laughs> appreciate you all coming. Oh, I was going to say send an email. Shoot an email to me, and uh, now I know where they're coming to so I can get them. <laughs> Inside joke for some of you. Um, but, yeah, shoot me an email. And introduce yourself, say hi, and Leticia, I am working on a solution for you. I'm trying to figure out how to do it exactly. I'll figure something out. But uh, yeah, shoot me an email, say hi. If you're, especially if you get in the insights, tell me why you're there. What are you looking for? What do you need? Um, because you're not investing in me. You're investing in yourself. Um, and if there's something I can do or add to it, or something that I can take that I've learned over the last almost 16 years and pass it on to you to help you get from point A to point B faster, then I'll do it. So just let me know. So anyway, with that being said, you all have a wonderful day, great week, and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.